What was your first vision for the exhibition? Well, I suppose I wanted to introduce people to the, the cultural climate in which she was working. It's quite extraordinary, Bologna in the 16th century, how liberal in many ways it was and how it encouraged women to be visible in society and, and be involved in uh, activities publicly. And so I wanted to introduce people to Livinia Fontana and help them to understand what it was that allowed her to become the first professional female artist outside a convent or a court and allowed her to be the first female artist with her own workshop. She is this forerunner. She's this absolute trailblazer. But that's our working title for the exhibition at the moment, Livinia Fontana, Rule Breaker, Trailblazer, because it was the best way I could introduce her to people, that she was a woman of so many firsts. And so I think it's important to ground people in that culture to, to explain what was special about Bologna as the second papal state to Rome, as a city without a court, as a city with Europe's oldest university. All of these different specific circumstances led to the birth of Fontana. And then after her, we have Elisabetta Sirani, and we have a great tradition of women artists in Bologna. It's a quite a special place. So I'm hoping that the exhibition can evoke that. And we're going to you know, include some objects and textiles in order to ground people in that reality and try to help them to understand what, what a place it was. It, one of the things that really strikes people as a, as a modern audience when I try to explain how many glass ceilings Fontana broke is, like you say, it was difficult enough to be trained as a woman in the Renaissance period in the 16th century. Fontana was trained by her father Prospero and she was you know, a very accomplished painter at an early age, but her parents recognised at a very early stage of her career that one of the necessities for her in order to freely engage in business negotiations were, was marriage. So she had to get married. In the 16th century, you know, to keep one's profession up after you're married was sort of unheard of. And so they found a perfect husband for her. They found this local nobleman who had trained as a painter with Prospero as well from Imola named Paolo Zappi. And they had a very unusual marriage contract that stipulated that Fontana was essentially to remain the breadwinner and that she would be allowed to continue to work and that Paolo Zappi would come and live with Prospero and Lavinia in Bologna. And so they made, they, they kind of manufactured this amazing relationship that enabled her to continue her work and enabled her to continue to progress. And I think that that's one of those things that when a modern audience hears about it, they go, wow, that is liberal. My grandmother, for example, she was a poultry inspector. There you go, strange job. But she had to quit that job when she married my, my grandfather. And that was pretty standard in Ireland up until, you know, the 90s nearly. So for a 16th century woman to have kept on working and maintained her career and found a man who would support her through that is, is extraordinary. And they had 11 children, 11 babies. Oh, she had incredible guidance. Her mother came from a large publishing house in Bologna, so she was very well connected as well. And her father was an artist, an esteemed artist in his day. And so they had ensured that she learned Latin. She was well educated. She knew about classical antiquity. And then after training her as a painter, the last piece of the puzzle was that ability to, to go out in public and, and negotiate freely. And that was, you know, to become a woman of virtue through marriage. But it is amazing that they made the stars align, essentially, in this very unique way.